Welcome to part five of this six part webinar series. We are working on diasublimation process, profiles, inks, and paper. My name is Lily Hunter, product manager here at Roland DGA. And I'm Mike Sanders with TVF Fabrics. All right, so let's go over what we're going to talk about in this section of our webinar series. We're going to talk about the importance of color profiles, using the correct color profiles. And I know there are times when I've actually personally said it myself that I do have my one go-to profile. However, with some people, you know, it depends on your customer. They want pretty bright colors. And if that profile does a job, great. But then you're going to have other customers that have certain fabrics, they're needing to hit certain spot colors, Coca-Cola Red, Home Depot Orange, whatever it is. You need the correct color profile. Your generic color profile is not it. So, yes. so we're going to go over the importance of that. Every fabric should have its own profile. Yes, if there are certain fabrics that are very, very similar that yes, you can get away using mm -hmm. the same profile for. But if you have thin fabrics, thick fabrics, and this. You optical brighteners, non optical Yes, you, know, you have to profile brightens. it. Yes. yes. So, or um, different optical brighteners. Different optical brighteners too. All right, and we're going to look at inks. Uh, not all sublimation inks are the same. So we'll go over what that means and choosing the right transfer paper for the job because you definitely need a good paper. And this is where I always hear people talk about, well, you're going to throw it away anyway, so can I just get cheap paper? So we'll go over why. <laughs> And why not? <laughs> Very scary. Very yeah, scary. So, so those are kind of like, so yeah, I'll go to my um, soapbox about transfer paper. It's amazing. The things that you throw away from the cores to things like that, these are actually really, really important to get good quality because they're very crucial yeah. in the success of, of what you're doing. Right. The paper, trans, it's what you're using to transfer on it. Yeah. And on certain things, if you don't have a, a heavy enough paper, people keep trying to cheapen things out, right. to go to a lighter paper, to try to cut and their costs. And cutting the cost of so much, but then you end up making these mistakes or, or having so many issues that in the long run, have you really saved money if you're redoing a right. job and stuff like that? I mean, like some that. places it will work, other places no. It's knowing mm -hmm. what to use for what job and what fabric. Absolutely, absolutely. So, a lot of words here. <laughs> so, um, linearization, ink limits, profiles. What does that mean? This is kind of... The basics of color profiles. I'm not going to go through every one of them. Um, actually, a colleague, Jay Roberts, and I um, did a three-part series on color management, how to create color profiles um, in ErgoSoft, which is included with our sublimation printers, as well as Roland VersaWorks, which is included in, in our other um, printers as well. So. You can always refer to those in our webinar archives, but just the basic things, linearization. This is actually checking on the health of your printer. How are your print heads firing? You're going to print out a linearization chart where there are ink limits. You know, it, it's a gradual um, increase of ink and, and, and you want to see a nice smooth gradual change. And you want to see from, it goes from zero to 100% in different steps. And, and what you're doing is you're seeing how well can the media handle the inks without it pooling. And it also, it starts you up to make sure that you set the right ink limit. So, so linearization is the beginning. It helps make sure that, that, that your print heads are firing properly. It shouldn't be light, light, dark. Yeah. <laughs> it should be a gradual well, yeah, increase. And that's what's so important. Every shift, you should just do, it takes no time. Mm -hmm. Make sure all your heads are firing properly mm -hmm. before they start a job. There's nothing right. worse than yes. finding out that you got something not firing and, and you're dropping out here and there and all of a sudden right. it affects the print and all of a sudden you printed all this paper. Right, right. So it's not just a matter of, you know, is it firing? Is, is it firing too much inks when it should not be? So these are things that you need to check. And you will need a spectrophotometer and this just reads the patches. Um, for sublimation, you're going to have to print, sublimate, read. So, so these are just the basics. The linearization is the foundation for setting the right color profile and setting the right ink limits. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't start out this way, you're never going to be able to be a successful printer. Right, and what does it mean to set ink limits? So this, these are ErgoSoft ink limit charts. 
So, um, so if you look at the top one, this, it hasn't even been transferred yet, but look at how much there's bleeding there is. It is just overly saturated. You're not looking so much for the color accuracy at this point. You just want to see as inks are building up on each other, is it still holding, especially the fine details and everything, exactly. or is it just pooling all over the place? Because honestly, oversaturation, more inks does not mean a wider color gamut or anything like that. You're, you're actually wasting uh, money. But on the flip side, you don't want to go so cheap where you're barely laying anything down. So, so there's usually a good range in regards to ink limits, depending on the ink. Sometimes some people will set it to, let's say, about 280%, 250%. There, there is a range that it's not too much or too little. Right. So, but the main thing is you want to see, is it bleeding? Is it causing issues. So if it's already bleeding on the paper and you haven't even gone through the sublimation process. Then, you're, then you've already already messed it up. And right. You're stopped right there. Right, right. Because you don't want to, um, this is your foundation. You set the ink limits too high, it carries all the way through in the profile making process. All right. So when you create a profile, it's pretty much you, you're, you've done your linearization, print heads are firing well, you've set your ink limits, now you're, you're trying to create a color profile. And what that basically is doing is most of the graphics are created in the RGB color space, which is huge, huge, huge. And you're going to print it on a CMYK printer, which is tiny. <laughs> so what you're trying to do is you're trying to map these colors, beautiful colors in the RGB space to replicate it in the CMYK printer. So that's where color profiles come in, is trying to map things so that way we can get the best output as possible. And, it, and as you're reading the color swatches and things, it takes into account the white points and so many different things. And, and so, yeah, so it, it is important to, yeah. to, you know, get the color profiles correct. And once you profile correctly, you're, everything's going to run smooth for you. If right. you don't do this, you're just, you're being a cowboy and you don't know what, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Right, you're, right. You're never going to be, you're never going to be happy with the outcome. Right. And once you set the profile, honestly, if things are all of a sudden looking different, maybe it looks too much, too saturated or, or not saturated, do another linearization. And you, all you have to do is just adjust the linearization. It will correct itself. So you don't have to re-profile once you dial it in. So, so that's where the importance is. And, and there's a lot of different uh, products out there for reading mm -hmm. and doing this. And, uh, you know, some are much better than others. Yes, the better ones are more expensive. Right. But it pays for itself. If you're going to be running that machine right. all day, then you really and, want to have yeah, really good equipment for that. For the color management and things like that. So, um, so keep that in mind in regards to creating the right color profile. And, and like I said, I, I have some new users who love vibrant colors. They're not looking to match a certain spot color or whatever. So a generic profile works for them. However, others need to match and you want to match it to the right fabric. Right. If it's if you're doing something that's a one off and you're never going to do it again, but if you're working with people that are going to want the same thing or variations of yes. the same thing and you'll do it and you do it the next time, well if it's not profiled, the next time it could be totally different. They'll get it and they'll say, This isn't the same and let's give it back to you. Right. And if you haven't done that, you don't even know where your base is. Right. If you don't have a profile for the fabric. Right, so right. So it's really, really important. If you want to have continuity, that has to be done. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's the, the um, color profile portion. So what about inks and transfer paper? So let's go over the basics of sublimation inks. They're water-based. There, there are few, few, few that are sol eco-solvent-based sublimation inks, but the majority are water-based inks. Yep. So basically water's holding all the dyes and, and all the other things in it. So it's usually about 60 to 70% water content. And the thing is with lower quality inks, say you're, you're like trying to save money, you wanna go cheap, usually it, they may have a higher water content and less dyes. What does that equate to? You need to add more inks to get the same vibrancy. And now when you load too much inks onto your paper, your paper can only hold so much water before it buckles and gets ugly and stuff like that. So, um, 
so go with a high quality. You get what you pay for. Yes. The, you know, the dispersings that are, that are for dye sublimation, there are lots of different qualities and a lot of different things you need to know on it, depending if you want, depending on what you're doing, if it's for outside or indoor. Mm -hmm. uh, there are different sets out there, depending on what goes on. So you really need to work with your uh, supplier right. to get the right, th make sure you have the right set of dyes in your machine. Right, and then for, you know, uh, you know, if you look at the different inks that are offered out there, they're formulated specifically for a specific print head, oh, yeah. the viscosity. Because what you're doing is you're jetting or pushing these, dropping these inks from the print head. It's, if it's not the correct formulation, it'll, it will not jet properly. If there may be clumpage or other things that, you know, that can cause a lot of issues. So, um, you know, for example, our OEM inks, uh, are made specifically for our print heads. So, you know, it, it matches. So as you're looking out there, um, you know, don't go cheap. No. There, there's a reason for it. And, and within the sublimation inks, you'll hear this all the time. The two biggest issues, especially if it's not used a lot or if it sits too long, there are two things. Um, and there are stabilizers added to those inks to make sure the molecules aren't settling you know, where it, it just separates and it just kind of, you know, the molecules just kind of, gravity just pulls everything down and it settles. So you have your clogs, dropouts, things of that nature. Well, then there's another thing if it's not stabilized. The molecules are now attracted to each other. So now they're clumping, forming clumps here and there. So similar issues with, with you know, ink dropouts, things, you know, it's not going through the clog print heads and things like that. Yeah, so make sure whoever is taking care of bringing the inks to the machine, mm -hmm. that they make sure they don't leave the ones in the back always in the back and keep using the ones in the front. Right, Because you're right. going to get to a point where all of a sudden, I've had those for two years, guess what, you're going to have a problem. Absolutely, which is so true because ink issues, there is a shelf life. Yeah, so you've got to go in and do it and make sure that they're rotating it yep. in the way you're buying it or you will have an FIFO, issue. FIFO, first in, first out. Yeah, and so very, very important. Make sure customers are properly cycling inventory and check to see the lot numbers and, and the ex expiration and find out what is the expiration date mm -hmm. from each manufacturer has something different. Some are, oh, it's six months, some is eight months, some is 12 months, some say 12, um, 24 months. But there's, you, you want a good fresh right. batch of ink or, or something that's stable. Because another thing is, you know, the ink ages, if there are severe shipping environments. You know, it goes through the frozen tundra, the inks freeze up, you know, and, um, and you know, there's so many different things. And, and ink manufacturers will let you know, you know, in case of that, you know, if it freezes, let it thaw, it should work, you know, but now your shelf life is this. So it has to do with aging the, um, and things of that nature that will affect your inks. And it could work, but you could also see color shifts right. as well as you go to actually a fresher, newer batch of and, inks. Right, and if you get, let's say you have a, a, you get a really big job and it's going to be mm -hmm. running for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Make sure you've got enough batch from all the yes. same. Don't be using three different lots of dyes and going back and forth. You might have things going off with your profile. So, right. you know, it's very simple. Just make sure that if you're doing that type of job, you buy for that job. Right, right. And... I heard this and I thought it was a joke, but I think they were serious. Um, some people try to save on buying black ink and they will take the ink from the waste bottle and recycle them to use it. If that is you, please do not do it. <laughs> buy, buy the black ink. Don't, oh. don't use waste bottle ink, <laughs> whatever wow. comes out of the waste bottle. Yeah. So uh, we, we want the, your images to look great. And also, you know, I've already said the print head compatibility. There are inks with different viscosity that are made for different types of print heads. So choose the inks for the right print head. And, you know, sometimes you have to go through cleaning cycles and things like that. Make sure you get the right cleaning solution for your ink. So say no. you have an equal solvent printer in your shop. Don't say, hey, I'm going to use this equal solvent, you know, cleaning simple solution. Green. Or simple <laughs> green or Windex. <laughs> Get the right cleaning fluids. If you mix equal solvent with water base, it's going to clump and gel up. So I didn't, yeah, and you don't want simple green or whatever. I yes. know people have done that. Yes, they've done it a lot. Yeah, we'll kind of cut corners, but ideally, you know, in a pinch, distilled water. But 
Yeah, don't 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 go adding something that's not made for that machine. Right, because you're going to do more damage, and then it can kick it out of warranty. Yep. And, and those print heads are expensive. Yeah, don't go there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Please. All right. Now transfer paper. That's another thing too. With that people try to go cheap on, mm -hmm. and and so there are different types of paper. And why you use transfer paper? It is a coated paper. Its purpose is to have the dyes sit on it and become solid where and then allow the water to evaporate and dry and eventually good paper will release the inks so it doesn't just soak into it and if it's good paper it also holds the fine details it's not going to puddle pool whatever It'll move this, on you yeah, yeah distort. assuming that you have the correct color profile and ink limits good paper will not only hold the ink droplets and but it also releases it, okay? So make sure you get a coated, um, a transfer paper and don't go um, cheap on it. And remember, if you're doing a, a fabric that's very thick mm -hmm. or you're doing light box, this is one of the best instances. Yes. You cannot go under like an 80 pound paper. Right. If, you, if not, you're not gonna have enough on it to be able to have the outcome you need to do a light box. Right. When you're putting your light box, you have to be able to transfer a large amount of ink onto the fabric. Right, right. And if you don't uh, have, you know, the right paper, you yeah. are going to see that and do not go cheap on that. 80 is the, is me, is the, right, is the, is the right. minimal. Because I know some people in the fashion industry, they want to go like the 60 pound and sometimes I've seen it for 40 pounds. Yeah. But when you go that light, it can't hold that much um, water. Right. So you're going to have to reprofile and hopefully your inks have a higher dye content so that way you get the vibrancy. And for some things you may not need the saturation but then you have sportswear and if you have a black um, shorts or black apparel or whatever you want that ink saturation for that opacity because the last thing you want to see is kind of like oh hey it's kind of sheer. <laughs> yeah you, so. you, know, you normally need to have at least two papers in your place. Right. You know, because when you don't need the extra stuff, if you are running a lot of really thin fabrics, yeah, you can get away mm -hmm. with with a lighter paper. But if you have thicker ones, and you most people do both, you're going to want to have multiple papers there. Right, right. And like our paper is 95 GSM grams per square meter, so that is kind of a middle of the road, not too light, not too heavy. So it, it can hold a yeah, variety. That's a but then there's also tack versus non-tack, and and traditionally, as you put it through the calendar you go with non-tack. Where you would use tack paper, it's activated by heat, so you don't feel a stickiness right away. It's like, say, as you were saying, if you have a sheer fabric mm -hmm. and you're feeding it through the press and you want to stop the fabric from shifting, moving, ghosting, whatever, that would be when you would use tack paper. Right. And that's for a calendar. For a, like a flatbed heat press, a clamshell and things of that nature, people that go with tack paper, they're doing the the all over sublimation on t-shirts or something. So you have your t-shirt, they're gonna put the paper, printed paper on it. You're, it's, the press is gonna press everything down. You don't want any shifting and that's where tack paper comes in handy because it's activated by heat, it sticks, and then when, and, and you, you're trying to prevent ghosting. Right, and then it releases fine. And you release it, right. Yes. There's, yeah, I've seen, I've seen some things that are tack that really aren't tack. <laughs> and, and I've seen some that are tack where trying to separate it was oh, like yeah. oh my goodness i think i just married the paper to the fabric <laughs> so yep. yeah so um, there are different tack levels depending on the manufacturer so when you can test for your application and see what works best all right so common paper issues the inks beat up or have that modeled look you have too much inks it can't hold it right um and number one thing poor ink release you have the correct color profile and all of a sudden you're seeing a lot of ink still left over and, and you compare it to another paper with the same temperature settings, dwell time, whatever, and it releases. Yeah, the, the coating, you have a poor coating, uneven coating, that's another issue. Um, coating may flake off or maybe there's no coating in one spot so you've sublimated everything and oh look, one spot, the ink didn't release. So we've seen that a few times. Yeah. Um, paper cockling because it can't handle the ink load, contaminants on the paper, you're print, you think you're printing mm -hmm. on the paper, but you print it on dirt and debris instead. So, yeah. so those you, are You always issues. get what you pay for. Yes, 
Yes. And just like the inks, there is a shelf life for the paper, for that coating. So, you know, once again, FIFO, first in, first out. And, and conditioning the paper, as we talked about, like you condition the fabrics before you print, condition the paper. If it's stored outside in a warehouse in an uncontrolled environment, bring it in. 24 hours, ideally, right. to a controlled environment. And if you have, if you really have to watch out too, if you're in a place that has super humidity, mm -hmm. it can actually damage the paper where you can't get it to fix. Right, right. If it gets because too you, much. Right, you don't want the paper to absorb moisture or anything like that. All right, so how do they interact? So when you go cheap on transfer paper, like I said, you're, you're trying to save you know, a little bit of money on some cheap transfer paper, it's not gonna hold the inks or you're gonna need, and if you have low quality inks, now you're gonna to have to load it with more inks to get the vibrancy, the paper's cockling, you're gonna have so many different issues and you end up having to run the job again. So how is that saving money in the long run? So, you know, poor transfer, poor quality paper won't hold the inks and it's not releasing the inks. And, and now you have too much inks. If you get some really cheap inks that is not a reputable manufacturer, you know, you don't know if, how much dye content versus water content. So, you know, yeah. now you're gonna have to really load in, use more inks, you're going through your inks more. So you, you do get what you pay right. for. And dispersed dyes, you know, the standardization of the dyes mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah, there, there's big differences out there in the market. Right, right. So, so that is your overview or overview from us in regards to the importance of paper and inks and, and the whole, you know, color profile and profiling. And process. Profiling is your key. Yes. Like, you, like I said, it, as we've been going on these uh, parts, if mm -hmm. everything's done the way we're talking about, you're not going to have any issues. It's going to run smooth. Right. And if there are issues, there are tips and tricks that we've shared in regards to how you document and journal things that will allow you to pinpoint try to it, pinpoint it and, and try to resolve right. it. Right, because it, look, if, if you are out there and you do enough paper and you do enough fabric, every time, there's, there's gonna, sooner or later, there's going to be a problem. It's how the problems get done and how you take care of it is what goes on. And the one thing is, if you, if you go by these techniques, when there is a problem, because you've done it this way, it's so easy for us to know what it is and be able to fix it and move on. And because you've done it so consistently and you know what to expect from based on all your notes, you're going to start seeing like, oh, I know, I think I know what happened. I th yeah. And you can actually resolve the issue yourself. Yeah. And then, then if there is a situation where maybe something froze somehow mm -hmm. or is there something wrong with the fabric, we're going to know right away because we know this customer does it everything perfectly. Mm -hmm. This is this and this. So we know we, we can take these variables out that if somebody doesn't have this all documented and not running by a system, you can fix it. So this is, you run by this, we're going to be really, everybody's going to be happy. Absolutely. So the next and last part of our six part series is the, the dye sublimation process, techniques and applications. So that will wrap it all up, so stay tuned for that. Thank you so much. Have a great day.